Edward Gibbon, the 18th century historian, is uh, quite easily the most famous authority on the Roman Empire. And his uh, six-volume work, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which uh, covers the end of both the Western and Eastern Roman Empires, is uh, still pretty much essential reading, even in this day and age, for uh, anyone wanting to get up to scratch on the subject. So let's take a closer look at the the five main reasons which uh, Gibbon thought were the most salient in the uh, success of Christianity during its first 400 years or so, and uh, which gained it ultimate victory over the Greco-Roman pagan beliefs. So in chapter 15 of Decline and Fall, Gibbon specifically addresses the issue of Christianity and its rise. And this is where he analyzes the advantages that the new religion had, and uh, these reasons are, by and large, still valid today, in my opinion, uh, in many parts of the world against uh, other modern-day religions, and uh, even in Europe and North America, where uh, Christianity is in uh, rapid decline, these uh, factors are slowing down the decay. By the way, if you'd like to read Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, I've uh, added links in the uh, description below. It, it really is one of the most valuable and uh, interesting works you can have on your bookshelf and uh, remains the definitive work on the subject as well. So let's get into it. Well, the, the first reason he gave, and uh, arguably the most important, was the, the strong expansionist attitude showed by Christians and uh, fueled by a revulsion towards uh, paganism. Gibbon writes, the inflexible and, uh, if we may use the expression, the intolerant zeal of the Christians, derived, it is true, from the Jewish religion, but purified from the narrow and unsocial spirit, which, uh, instead of inviting, had uh, deterred the Gentiles from embracing the law of Moses. So the desire to supplant other beliefs was uh, never part of the DNA of the pagan religions. They, uh, they had a live and let live approach. And uh, the only religion or people at that time, as uh, Gibbon mentions, that had any sort of exclusivist agenda and a, a feeling of superiority over the others were the, uh, were the Jews who, as a race, believed they were the chosen people of God. But the Jews had no real inclination to share this uh, chosen status with too many other people, as uh, that would naturally lessen the very nature of this uh, exclusivity. And uh, so in consequence, Judaism gave the Jews no great impetus to uh, convert others of different races. They preferred to keep this status and uh, accolade of the, uh, the, quote, chosen ones, unquote, largely, uh, largely to themselves. So the result was that they became uh, extremely insular in nature and uh, separating themselves from others with their own distinct customs and uh, rituals and religious rites, as uh, Gibbon describes, while uh, nevertheless looking down on pagans and their beliefs. And in turn, as Gibbon suggests, other people were uh, in any case repelled by the uh, numerous laws, restrictions and uh, complex rituals and all the various do's and don'ts that uh, Judaism insists on. And he suggests the, the one that repelled them the most may have been that of the uh, ritual of circumcision, the uh, physical mutilation of the body, something which uh, the Greeks, uh, connoisseurs of beauty and uh, aesthetics, might have uh, found totally alien and uh, a bridge they would never cross. So put simply, there was a great divide between the pagans and the Jews, and even though many pagans might have been interested in the idea of a single, all-powerful deity. Christianity, on the other hand, very early on adopted a, an entirely different outlook. It retained the same scriptures, so basically inheriting the same superior and uh, contemptuous regard to pagans. But it released people from the burden of the Mosaic laws, even though they were clearly specified and had no end date. And uh, so this meant the ability to gain converts to a belief in a single deity became a, a lot easier as there was uh, no real Jewish baggage involved. So you had this strange situation where the Jews were given the accolade of being the, the chosen race, according to the Old Testament, but uh, suddenly all people were now entitled to be, uh, quote, saved, unquote. But stopping the Mosaic laws meant the uh, Jewish contempt for pagans was now uh, inherited by the Christians and uh, channeled into a very uncompromising missionary zeal. Gibbon writes, Every privilege that could raise the proselyte from earth to heaven, that could exalt his devotion, secure his happiness, or uh, even gratify that secret pride which, uh, under the semblance of devotion, insinuates itself into the human heart, was still reserved for the members of the Christian church. But at the same time, all mankind was permitted and even uh, solicited to accept the glorious distinction which was uh, not only preferred as a, a favour but uh, imposed as an obligation. It became the most sacred duty of a new convert to uh, diffuse among his friends and relations the inestimable blessing which he had received and to uh, 
warn them against a refusal that would be severely punished as a, a criminal disobedience to the will of a benevolent but all-powerful deity. Gibbon's second reason was the deep desire for a physical afterlife. Gibbon explains it as follows. The doctrine of a future life improved by every additional circumstance which could give weight and efficacy to that important truth. In other words, the promise of life in heaven. And uh, so this tapped into the base human yearning to, to live forever. And uh, there are constant references to uh, eternal life in the Gospels, even though the the consequences and paradoxes of a never-ending life in a blissful and uh, idyllic paradise are, uh, are never really discussed. But it addressed the, the superficial and uh, materialistic desire within the common man to uh, continue living even after death. So it's not surprising this message resonated with a large section of the public in Roman times and uh, who were vulnerable to the offer of living forever if only they would become believers. Gibbon writes, when the promise of eternal happiness was uh, proposed to mankind on condition of adopting the faith and of observing the precepts of the gospel, it is no wonder that uh, so advantageous an offer should have been accepted by great numbers of uh, every religion, of every rank and of uh, every province in the Roman Empire. And Gibbon goes on to mention that there was uh, a sense of urgency as well, since the second coming of Jesus was uh, expected at any time. And he was referring to uh, Matthew chapter 4. 24, for, uh, for example, where Jesus is uh, promising to return before his supporters on earth died out. Gibbon suggests that this really fired up the early Christians as uh, time was short. He writes, The revolution of 17 centuries has uh, instructed us not to press too closely the mysterious language of prophecy and revelation, but as long as, uh, for wise purposes, this error was permitted to subsist in the church, it was productive of the most salutary effects on the faith and practice of Christians, who lived in the uh, awful expectation of that moment when the globe itself and all the various race of mankind should uh, tremble at the appearance of their divine judge. Now, this doesn't mean the belief of a heaven and uh, eternal life for believers didn't cause some uneasiness amongst uh, Christians as to the... Uh, unfairness of a system where a virtuous man but not a believer was uh, condemned to hell merely for not being a, a Christian. Gibbon writes, the condemnation of the, the wisest and most virtuous of the pagans on account of their ignorance or disbelief of the divine truth seems to uh, offend the reason and the humanity of the present age. But the primitive church whose faith was of a much firmer consistence and uh, delivered over without hesitation to uh, eternal torture the far greater part of the human species. A charitable hope might perhaps be indulged in the in favour of Socrates or some other sages of antiquity who had uh, consulted the light of reason before that of the, uh, the gospel had arisen, but it was unanimously affirmed that those who, since the birth of the death of Christ, had uh, obstinately persisted in the worship of the demons, ne neither deserved nor could expect a pardon from the uh, irritated justice of the deity. But whatever the ins and outs of eternal life, it uh, certainly appealed to the common masses and uh, also had the effect of encouraging converts to uh, try and convert other friends, family and colleagues in, uh, in order to, quote, save them, unquote, from uh, eternal torture in hell. Gibbon writes, the careless polytheist, assailed by new and unexpected terrors against which uh, neither his priests nor his philosophers could afford him any certain protection, was uh, very frequently terrified and subdued by the menace of eternal tortures. His fears might uh, assist the progress of his faith and reason, and uh, if he could once persuade himself to suspect that the Christian religion might possibly be true, it became an easy task to convince him that it was the safest and most prudent party that he could possibly embrace. The third reason Gibbon gave was the ubiquity of uh, miracles and um, other supernatural paraphernalia in Christian belief. He, descri he describes it as the miraculous powers ascribed to the primitive church. And this related to the uh, exploitation of the various uh, alleged miracles done by Jesus and uh, following his death, the various apostles in their uh, missionary efforts to gain converts. So basically, Christianity relies heavily on miracles and uh, most of the gospel stories are really largely vehicles to showcase uh, Jesus' talents in terms of working miracles. The emphasis is uh, more on the miracles than uh, any lengthy discourses or uh, teaching or sermons by Jesus articulating his views on the uh, 
the nature of the universe, uh, his philosophy and uh, any great theological pondering that he might have uh, uh, might uh, wanted to have uh, communicated to his followers. And this was a, a far cry from the uh, the rational world of the Greek Stoics or uh, Plato or Aristotle, for example, who didn't rely on the supernatural or um, supposed miracles to uh, try and persuade possible converts, but relied purely on truth and wisdom to understand the universe. But this message was uh, inherently plainer and more boring than the uh, miracle-saturated stories of the Gospels, and it's, uh, it's not difficult to see the common, uneducated masses being more uh, inclined to listen to the more uh, elementary Gospel stories than to the, uh, the complex and dense but common-sense thinkings of the uh, Stoic philosophers. Gibbon writes, Accustomed long since to observe and to respect the variable order of nature, our reason, or at least our imagination, is not sufficiently prepared to sustain the visible action of the deity. But in the first ages of Christianity, the situation of mankind was extremely different. The most curious or the most credulous amongst the pagans were often persuaded to enter into a society which asserted an actual claim of miraculous powers. The primitive Christians perpetually trod on mystic ground and uh, their minds were exercised by the habits of believing the most extraordinary events. They felt or they fancied that on every side they were incessantly assaulted by demons, comforted by visions, instructed by prophecy and uh, surprisingly delivered from danger, sickness and from death itself by the uh, supplications of the church. The fourth reason Gibbon gave was, uh, quote, the, the pure and austere morals of the Christians. So to be clear, these morals weren't the same sophisticated morals and ethics of the uh, 20th and 21st century, and uh, which we accept today. Um, so there wasn't any uh, condemnation of slavery, for instance, by Jesus, or uh, any sermons on the uh, advancement of the uh, equality of women, or uh, racial equality, or uh, criticism of uh, Imperialism, for instance, the uh, uh, we have to remember the Romans had recently taken hold of the country, and so forth. Um, these morals were the, the more bread and butter morals that uh, Christianity was concerned with, based on the the Ten Commandments, and uh, were mainly the fundamental morals like uh, not killing or uh, or stealing or uh, leading a, a hedon hedonistic lifestyle and uh, not bearing false witness and so on. But the older pagan religions had uh, stopped enforcing these, so whatever the rights and wrongs of Christian dogma, upholding these uh, principles gave a, a significant edge and the moral high ground to the Christians. And of course this helped to, to gain more converts as the, uh, the masses saw the pagan priests perhaps not preaching to the, uh, the same high standards. The fifth reason and the last reason Gibbon gave was uh, also something inherited and retained from the Jewish religion. And that was... Quote, the union and discipline of the Christian Republic, which uh, gradually formed an independent and uh, increasing state in the heart of the Roman Empire. So the Jews had a strong sense of brotherhood and uh, acted almost as a different body of people within the Roman Empire with their own rituals and customs. And the Christians kept the same uh, unnecessary exclusiveness and brotherhood, uh, albeit at the expense of causing estrangement with uh, pagan culture and its people, just like the Jews did. In essence, like the Jews, the, the Christians acted as a group within a group, but uh, bent on subverting the larger group to its will by conversion. Pretty much like modern-day cults see themselves as different from non-believers, although they will live in the same community and uh, go out into the wider community in order to proselytise. The other point was that the primitive church had its own hierarchy, specifically organised to aid in expansion. The churches had bishops, later a pope as well, priests, deacons, and a whole host of uh, people working under them, with the uh, areas being uh, split up into various dioceses. The idea being every diocese become, became the responsibility of the local Christians in terms of converting pagans. In contrast, the, the pagan temples just weren't set up for any sort of uh, religious imperialism. Gibbon describes the pagan temples as being in charge of the nobility and the senatorial classes, with many of these having considerable wealth. But because of their uh, distinguished positions in life, these uh, men were given the care of a temple or other religious place or of a uh, public sacrifice, but may not have had the, the time or the, or the real interest to promote the belief or the temple. 
Quote, these men exhibited very frequently at their own expense the sacred games and with uh, cold indifference performed the ancient rites according to the laws and fashion of their country. As they were engaged in the ordinary occupations of life, their zeal and devotion were seldom animated by a sense of interest or by the uh, habits of an ecclesiastical character. Confined to their respective temples and cities, they uh, remained without any connection of discipline or, or government. And uh, while they acknowledged the, the supreme jurisdiction of the Senate, of the of the College of Pontiffs and of the Emperor, these, uh, uh, these civil magistrates contented, contented themselves with the easy task of maintaining in peace and dignity the general worship of mankind. The accidental circumstances of their life and uh, situation determined the object as well as the degree of their devotion, and, and uh, as long as their adoration was uh, successfully prostituted to a thousand deities, it was scarcely possible that their uh, hearts could be susceptible of a very sincere or lively passion for any one of them. And so there it is, Edward Gibbons and the, the five main points he chose in uh, Decline and Fall to illustrate the, the rise of Christianity, although I'm sure he could have uh, added a few more. And I guess these points weren't just relevant in Roman times, but had their uh, influence in the conversion of pagan northern Europe once the uh, Western Roman Empire had fallen. The Germanic pagan tribes, the, the Goths, the Vandals, the, the Franks, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxons uh, and others displayed the same weakness in their religious institutions as the, uh, the Roman pagans had. And uh, similar to the, the Roman pagans, they had no genetic zeal to uh, convert or desire to capture more turf for their religion. No powerful institutions or uh, organisations to protect or further their beliefs or, uh, or culture as well. And that's it. Thanks for watching this video.